Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to look at how we can implement multi-tenancy in Entity Framework Core using a database per tenant. Now, a database per tenant means that each tenant has their own separate database. This enables strong data isolation and is especially useful when dealing with user data or other personally identifiable information because each tenant's data is completely isolated in its own individual database. So as you can see over here on the left hand side, I have a basic new ASP.NET Core API. We have an application DB context class, which contains an author entity and a book entity like so. We've then got our app settings and our development app settings. Notice that I have the tenants configured in the app settings for the purposes of this sample, but feel free to use an alternative tenant store in your project. We then have our program startup where we are adding in the multi-tenant services to our applications services. We're setting up the host strategy which means that we get the tenant identifier from the first part of the host name. We're then using the configuration store to store the tenant configuration. And you can then see the first middleware that we are using is the multi-tenant middleware to ensure that runs first before any of the other middleware in our application. So what we are going to do first of all is we're going to update that tenant configuration in our development app settings to include the connection string for each of the tenants. So what we are going to do is we're going to create a property in here called connection string. And this will map onto the connection string property of the tenant info class in the Finbuckle multi-tenant and NuGet package. Now this connection string is just going to point to a local Postgres database for this sample, but feel free to use an alternative database provider in your application. What I'll do there is create that connection string again for tenant two, but notice I'm going to change the database from one to two. So tenant one will have its data stored in the database one, and tenant two will have its data stored in the database two. That enables the isolation of data because each of the tenants has their own individual database. They could be on the same server or they could be on different servers, but the important thing for this strategy is that they have their own individual database, hence the different database names in both of those connection strings. So what we're going to do now is add in our application DB context to our startup. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say builder.services.addbcontext of type application DB context. And then going to use the action that provides us with the service provider and the DB context options builder, like so. Just rename those properties to make them explicitly clear. And what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to change where we get the connection string from based on where we are running the application. So when the application is deployed and running, we're going to want to get the connection string from the multi-tenant context provided by the multi-tenant services. However, when we are applying migrations using the .NET CLI locally, we're going to want to pass in the connection string from the command line. That's because there won't be a host name to get the tenant identifier from when we're running migration commands locally using the .NET Entity Framework Core CLI. So what we're going to do is we're going to say var connection string like so, and then we're going to say equals array dot index of args and we're going to explicitly look for connection string, like so. If we find uh, the value connection string in the list of arguments given to the application, then we can safely assume that we are running a migration command locally 
and say we will use that value as the connection string. So what we do is we say args like so, and then we say array dot index of args and once again connection string like so. And then we will specify plus one like so because we will pass in the actual connection string value after the dash dash connection dash string. So that covers the use case where the connection string will be passed in on the command line. However, if the connection string is not passed in on the command line, then we will resolve it using the tenant info from the multi-tenant context. And to do that, we're going to say service provider dot get required service of type I multi-tenant context accessor of type tenant info. And then we're going to say dot multi-tenant context dot tenant info dot connection string like so. And last but not least, we can say db context options builder dot use npg sql. And then we can pass in the connection string like so. Again, if you're using an alternative database provider, then use the appropriate method there to pass the connection string into your database provider of choice. So that is our application DB context registered within our applications services, independency injection. And what we're going to do now is create a migration for the database. So what I am going to do is I am going to pop down here to the Docker Compose file and I'm going to spin up the DB service like so. As we can see here, we have the database running and we need the database running in order to create the initial migration. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up the terminal I'm going to CD into the API project like so. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the command to add the initial create migration. Copy that onto the clipboard and then paste it in like so. And you can see there we are saying .NET EF migrations add initial create. Initial create being the name of the migration. You can then see that we have two hyphens and then we have our hyphen hyphen connection hyphen string space and then the actual value of the connection string. Now it's important to provide these two hyphens like so because that separates the arguments for our application from the arguments for the .NET CLI. Anything to the left of the two hyphens is provided to the .NET Core CLI, and anything to the right of the two hyphens is provided to our application. And we can then read those arguments using the logic that we previously set up when we add in our application DB context. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run that command like so. And what that's going to do is build the application and then create our migration. If we expand the migrations folder, you'll notice that we have our initial create migration with our authors table and our books table and also the primary keys and foreign keys created appropriately, ready to go in our Postgres database. Again, this will look slightly different potentially if you're using an alternative database provider. So that is the migration created. And what we're going to do now is update the database to apply that migration. So you'll notice that we created one migration, but what we're going to do now is apply that migration to both of our two databases. So first of all, we're going to run .NET EF database update, and we're going to provide the same connection string with the database equaling one. That's the database that we chose for tenant one earlier on in the sample. If I run that command, it's going to build the application and it's going to then apply that migration. And what I'm then going to do is run the exact same command again, 
However, this time I'm going to pass in the database 2 instead of 1. So running that exact same command with the updated connection string, we'll do the same uh, migration, but it will apply the migration to the database 2 instead of the database 1. So what I can do if I close that to now verify that has applied, if I open up the database explorer over here on the right hand side, you'll notice that we have our database 1 and we have our database 2. If I just uh, refresh that uh, like so and then select the schema, you'll notice that we have the two database there like so. And inside both of these databases, we have our entity framework migrations history, like so. And then we have our authors table and our books table, respectively, in each of the databases. So what we are going to do now is we're going to seed those databases with some data. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is open up the query console for the database one. And what I'm going to do is I am going to copy a couple of insert scripts like so. And this is going to insert an author and a book into the database. So if I run that command, we can see that it's inserted both an author and a book into the database. And what I'm going to do is do the same thing again with the query console in tenant 2's database. And I'm going to, again, copy a couple of SQL inserts to insert an author and a book. Running these commands like so, we can see we have two rows affected overall. We can see we've inserted an author and a book into our tenant2 database. And to verify that data, you can see that we have our book inside tenant1 called Hello Tenant1. And we have our book inside tenant two called Hello Tenant Two. So that's our data seeded in both our one database and our two database. And what we can now do is we can now actually run the application. But just before we do that, we're going to jump into our startup and we're going to update this map get root to return a list of books from the database. So what we do is we will change the path from just a forward slash to a forward slash API forward slash books. And then inside the handler, we're going to say uh, from services. And then we're going to say application DB context, context like so. And then instead of returning the string hello world, we're going to return context.books. And this will return the books from the database. And you'll recall earlier on that we set up the connection string for the application DB context based on the connection string from the tenant info of the current multi-tenant context. And that's all set up and injected using the multi-tenant middleware that we run first and foremost in our middleware pipeline. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to select the Docker Compose configuration and I'm going to run that and that's going to build and start all of the services for our application. You'll notice that we have our API, we have our database and we have our reverse proxy. And we can see here we have the logs for our API application. And what I'm going to do now is open up Postman and I'm going to send a get request to the URL https onexamplelocal forward slash API forward slash books. Now you'll recall in our startup, we configure the multi-tenant services to use the host strategy, which means that they get the tenant identifier from the first part of the host name. In this case, that is one in one.example.local and that matches with the identifier one in our tenant configuration, which means that it will use this connection string looking at our database one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back into Postman, send that request, and you'll notice 
that uh, you can see here, we have our ID, our title and our author ID. You'll notice the title is Hello Tenant 1 because it's using the One database. If I now change this URL to 2.example.local forward slash API forward slash books and send the request, you'll notice that I now have the Hello Tenant 2 book. And that's because it's now using the connection string for our database 2. So this sample has shown you how you can configure Entity Framework to support multi-tenancy using the Finbuckle multi-tenant NuGet package. I've shown you how you can uh, apply the connection string for the database based on either an argument given to the command line, which is useful for running migrations locally using the CLI, or using the multi-tenant context accessor to resolve the connection string from the current tenant info of the multi-tenant context. And we've then created a simple endpoint that returns the list of books from the books table in either the one database or the two database, depending on which tenant has been resolved using the host strategy. So as I mentioned earlier on, the database per tenant strategy is useful when you want complete data isolation, where you have the data for each tenant residing in completely separate databases. And that's particularly useful when you're dealing with things like user data or other personally identifiable information, and you want the information and data stored to be completely isolated between tenants. As I say, for the purposes of this sample, we've just used books and authors but in your application, as I say, you might be storing things like user data or other personally identifiable information. So as I say, in this sample, I've shown you how to set up Entity Framework Core to use the database per tenant, multi-tenancy strategy. I hope you found this video useful. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.